now that we have learnt uh, how classical conditioning takes place, okay, what we have done till now? Uh, we have uh, seen that bell, food getting associated, Kamin's experiment, we saw sound and light getting paired with electric shock. Okay. What if the uh, what you call uh, situation, this association, the SR uh, bond that we learned in one situation, can that be extended to the other situation? Remember the first lecture where uh, we discussed while defining learning that it is a relatively stable change. If it is a relatively, if learning is a relatively stable change, what would it lead to? It would lead to a scenario where this SR bond repeatedly helps us arrive at a prospective decision much easily. Okay, we do not invest much time and come across a most appropriate response given the fact that we know that in these type of situations, these are uh, the uh, what you call uh, successful response patterns. Hence, we come to important uh, concepts in classical conditioning, two important concepts let us discuss and gradually we will move. One, generalization and two, discrimination. What would be generalization? You know, the tendency to generalize. Okay. So, a tendency of a similar, but new stimulus to elicit a response that is similar to the conditioned uh, response that is generalization. Okay. So, if I uh, say for example, the example we took uh, in one of our lectures where the student will leave the seat, if the teacher comes into the class okay, and if this is extended, okay, not only to the teachers entering the class, but to all elderly people, you have generalized it. Okay. So, what is it that is being generalized? Okay. Depending on the similarity the response is now generalized. The reverse of it would be discrimination. Okay. In one case, you are favorably responding no? and extending the uh, response that is generalization. In discrimination, it is basically the process of learning to respond to certain stimuli and not to respond to other. Okay. Take the same example. You have learned to leave your chair and wish a teacher who enters the class and uh, say, instead of a teacher, somebody else enters the class, okay. somebody who has come for dusting enters the class and you immediately use your discrimination. Okay. You discriminate that although this is an adult, maybe uh, of the same age uh, of that of the teacher, but because he or she is not my teacher, therefore I do not have to leave my seat. This is discrimination. Okay. Interesting uh, thing that Pavlov also found in his research was two interesting things. One, what is called as extension, and other is the spontaneous recovery. Now, recollect the experiment. The dog in uh, Pavlov's lab okay, had learned to respond to the sound of the bell, anticipating that every time that the bell is rung, the food will definitely be presented. Now, once this association was formed and Pavlov stopped giving food to the dog and only generated the sound from the bell, gradually what happened? The amount of saliva that the dog was releasing, which was being collected in the beaker, okay, started diminishing. This means that that association which was formed and which was you know, influencing anticipation in the dog, that every time that uh, the sound will be rung food will definitely be presented started becoming weaker and weaker. Once the bell was uh, rung, but the food was not presented twice, thrice, 10 times, 20 times and then you realize that gradually the SR bond which was initially very, very strong starts becoming weaker enough. Okay. So, weakening of the conditioned response because the unconditioned stimulus is now absent is what is called as extension. Okay and Pavlov could, found, uh, could find this in uh, his experiment. But another interesting thing that he also observed was the fact that the dog which had forgotten to salivate on sound of the bell okay, could 
again you do the same exercise of salivating on the sound of the bell when the experiment was repeated for the next time. So, if in the initial trial the dog took uh, say, uh, say for instance 20 trials to learn to form the association, in the next case the dog took uh, substantially less number of trials 8, 9, 10 trials. Okay. So, you reduce the total time taken to relearn what you had already learned okay. and this is called as spontaneous recovery. So, a conditioned response reoccurs, resurfaces after a time delay okay, without further conditioning, without further demand that no this SR association should once again be formed. This is called as spontaneous recovery. Okay. So, these were you know the important constructs and this was the first and of course, one of the historically I should say uh, mega theory uh, in learning that Ivan Pavlov contributed. In terms of uh, what you call uh, the appraisal, okay, in terms of uh, types you can say, how many types of classical conditioning you can think of. Again, it has to do with the valency, positive valency and the negative valency. Classical conditioning can be divided into two types, two types of classical conditioning, classical reward conditioning and classical aversive conditioning. And because you can understand reward means you will be uh, you know, uh, basically reinforcing the behavior. So, if you uh, know, ask the dog to do a desired behavior and what you want the dog to do if the dog has done and you give food pallet you have reinforced the dog. This is classical reward conditioning. Okay. So, if uh, the student has uh, given the correct answer to the teacher and, te and the teacher you know, praises the student, the student's behavior has been reinforced. This is called classical reward conditioning. What is classical aversive conditioning? This is basically the conditioned stimulus that is paired with aversive stimulus. No? So, if you receive a negative consequence okay, that is the aversive conditioning. Reward in positive reinforcement, aversion will be negatively taught. Two interesting cases, no, till now we have talked about only uh, animal experimentations. Two experiments are worth mentioning here. Watson in 1920 tried to condition a human baby named Albert and in all books of psychology you will find Albert's case. Uh, Albert was basically uh, you know, conditioned to fear white rats. So, what actually happened was Albert the small baby would crawl move to a soft toy and the moment Albert was about to hold the soft toy, Watson would create a big sound, big uproaring sound in the lab. This was repeated couple of times and the human baby Albert started you know, getting scared of that uh, furry toy. So, the moment the furry toy would come there, Albert would perhaps anticipate that now definitely this will result into that frightening sound. And this very fear that was initially for uh, you know, a furry uh, white rat got even generalized to rabbit, dogs and seal skin coats. Remember, uh, it is a very old experiment, ethical considerations were not so important in those days. And Albert was not reconditioned okay, after the experimentation. But what Watson was able to prove uh, using Albert's case was that see even in human beings also you can induce certain types of learning using classical conditioning module. One of the associates of Watson, uh, Mary Jones in 1924, what uh, this team did was they took another boy named Peter and Peter was basically you know uh, made to fear white rats, fur coats, frog, fishes and mechanical toys. Okay. But then this was an experiment which went one step ahead of Watson's experiment okay. and Peter was later counter conditioned and it was this success of counter conditioning which later on brought a big change even in clinical psychology in terms of uh, intervention that all learned behavior, okay, if you have conditioned somebody, you can recondition and you can decondition. Okay. So, in classical conditioning, the entire process of behavior modification is based on this okay, and the credit goes to the experiments done by uh, Watson 
uh, Mary Jones and all their associates. Around the same time when uh, you know, Pavlov was uh, doing experimentation on dog, E. L. Thorndike was you know, conducting similar type of research using cats and this was being done in a puzzle box. Now, this was the puzzle box. Okay. The mechanism was very, very simple. The mechanism was that a cat was put here in the cage. The cat was supposed to press this lever and the moment this lever will be pressed, this door will flung open and the cat can come out. Okay. Too simple an experiment, but the cat did not know that it was supposed to press the lever. Okay. So, accidentally while making all types of random jerk movement, the cat accidentally happened to press the lever. Okay. A fish was kept outside this cage, cat will press the lever, the door will flung open, the cat would come out, eat the fish and this is how the experiment took place. Okay. But then what was being demonstrated basically was that behavior always follows a positive outcome and behavior that is followed by positive outcomes are strengthened. Whereas, behavior which uh, is followed by a negative outcome is not strengthened. Random movement leading to no consequence, but pressing of lever allows the door of the cage to get open. This is what the cat wanted. The cat was uh, no, uh, attracted towards the fish kept out of the cage okay, and it was this desired behavior that required the cat to come out of the cage. So, now the key question is that how the correct SR bond strengthens and eventually dominates the incorrect SR bonds. So, stimulus response association will be formed. If I have you know, uh, learnt an incorrect association, how does the correction take place? Now, according to Thorndike, the correct stimulus response association actually strengthens and the incorrect ones becomes weak and weaker enough because the consequence of the action. So, if I have uh, you know, not learned how to respond appropriately in a given situation, every time I repeat my inappropriate behavior, okay, I do not receive a positive feedback from the environment. And this absence of uh, feedback from the uh, environment gives me a sense that this association the behavior that I am demonstrating is not appropriate. Whereas, if I change it, make it appropriate enough, then the feedback that is given to me is very positive. And because uh, I receive a positive feedback for the new SR bond, this bond becomes stronger enough and the bond that was initially learned by me becomes weaker enough. Okay? And this is this view is basically uh, you know, called as the SR theory, the stimulus response theory. And later on it was B. F. Skinner who expanded this idea of uh, stimulus response theory and he uh, came forward with again another mega, mega, mega theory uh, in learning what is called as operant conditioning. Okay. So, in the next lecture we would be you know, exclusively talking about uh, Skinner's experimentation and uh, you know, a new set of conditioning that he proposed what was what is popularly called as uh, operant conditioning or instrumental conditioning.